artificial selection has been applied to all of our uh, modern uh, agricultural, horticultural varieties. Uh, Darwin actually experimented with artificial selection. He infiltrated uh, one of the uh, most popular social circles of London at the time, which were pigeon fanciers. Yes, people who raised pigeons uh, for their particular uh, characteristics. And he writes extensively in Origin of Species about how he was able to develop new varieties of pigeons. So in looking at artificial selection, and in all of his observations uh, through his world travels and through uh, experiments he did uh, with other organisms, he drew two inferences from two observations. Uh, observation number one, that members of a population are going to vary in heritable traits. So here we can see in this population of ladybugs, they have different numbers of spots. The sizes of the spots are different. And shades of red are somewhat different. And much of that variety is heritable. That's the, the key there, is that it is uh, transmissible by inheritance, not just environmental. Second observation. All species are capable of reproducing more than the environment can support which means that not all of the offspring are going to be able to survive and reproduce. So here we've got a puffball, a type of fungus, that is uh, bellowing out this cloud of spores. And in this cloud of spores, there are millions and millions of spores, uh, which are a mode of dispersal for this organism. And... Uh, if all of these spores found a purchase and were able to grow into new uh, fungi, we'd be covered in fungi. The entire Earth would be covered in just this one species of fungi, but it's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that some of these uh, spores are going to grow into new fungi and perpetuate the species but not all of them, only the ones that uh, find a suitable habitat. So, based on those two observations, he came up with two inferences. The first being that individuals whose inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing within a given environment will leave more offspring than other individuals in that environment. And you can see in this picture that there are two moths. There's one right here. See that one right there? And another one, maybe you didn't see it, that's over here. Now, if you were a bird, a visual predator, uh, which you might have gone after this moth over here, and you may not have seen this moth over here. So over time, you would expect that you would see, uh, or not see, more of this variety of moth than this variety of moth. And these moths are conspecific, they're the same species, but two different color morphs. Uh, so this individual here has a higher probability of surviving and reproducing than this one here. So, because there is an unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce, survive and reproduce, we keep seeing that, uh, that's going to lead to the accumulation of favorable traits uh, in the population through generations. So there's going to be this uh, environmental pressure towards uh, generating a match between uh, the, the population and the environment. Survive and reproduce. Survive and reproduce. We keep seeing that. What does it mean to survive and reproduce? That's what we mean by fitness. Hello, can you still hear me? Uh, so Darwin also had influence through uh, Thomas Malthus, who was another uh, theologian and uh, also an early statistician, who wrote a book entitled An Essay on the Principle of Population. 
Uh, an in principle essay on the principle of population, Malthus suggested that uh, resources like food and clean water uh, increase at a pace that is uh, arithmetic, so like the straight line here, whereas population growth uh, occurs at a geometric rate. So it's kind of like the shape of this other curve here. At a certain point, uh, the population, if it outstrips or surpasses the potential for resources to be produced, there's going to be a crisis, a war, a famine, uh, something where if you can't have a population that exceeds the resources to sustain it. Uh, he was talking about human populations, but Darwin said if this was so for human populations, uh, certainly you could apply this to natural populations as well. He concluded then that if some heritable traits are advantageous, they're going to accumulate in a population. And generation through generation, uh, you're going to get uh, a match between organisms and their environment. So, in summary, here's what Darwin put forth in uh, On the Origin of Species. The individuals with heritable characteristics uh, that are favorable will survive and reproduce at a higher rate than those who do not have those heritable characteristics. Natural selection is going to increase the adaptation of organisms to their environment over time because they are better suited to their environment and more likely to survive and reproduce. Uh, so and if an environment changes over time, that means that the direction of natural selection may change uh, and you're going to result in uh, adaptation to new conditions that may give rise to new species. So, for example, here are two species of mantids, uh, or praying mantises. This one here is a flower mantid that's found in Malaysia. This one here is a leaf mantid that's found in Borneo. And they share common ancestry, uh, praying mantises, uh, we have praying mantises around here. They tend to be uh, relatively small and greenish. Uh, and you may or may not always see them because they do blend in with their environment. And you can see that these mantids are kind of extreme examples of blending in with their environment. Uh, this leaf mantid here uh, looks an awful lot like just another leaf on the ground. And that if some photographer hadn't uh, taken this picture and squared it up nicely and made it pretty clear where the mantid is, you might not have seen it. And this flower mantid here, same story. If somebody hadn't taken a nice picture and pointed out to you, oh look, here is a praying mantis, uh, you might not have noticed it. So different habitats, changing habitats, can lead to different selective pressures, which lead to uh, different uh, characteristics being favored, and favored races producing more progeny. And when Darwin mentions races, uh, he's not necessarily talking about human races, he's talking about uh, populations uh, and c populations of organisms that have uh, more desirable heritable characteristics. So important, we need to remember individuals do not evolve by means of natural selection. Yes, we grow and develop and change throughout our lives. But that's not what Darwin was talking about. He was not talking about uh, old, going from birth to old age or something like that. He was talking about uh, how species originate. And it's not with individuals, it is through populations. And the populations are what evolve over time. Populations are the basic unit of evolution. So natural selection can increase or decrease uh, traits that vary in a population, but there has to be that variation in the first place uh, in order for selection to act upon it. And what is ad adaptive in one environment may not necessarily be adaptive in a very different environment. So, uh, since Darwin's time, uh, the reason that we continue to accept evolution by means of natural selection as a model 
for explaining the unity and diversity of life on Earth and the match between organisms and their environment is that evidence has been piling in. Uh, Darwin doesn't say anything about Mendel or genetics or any of that or chromosomal basis of inheritance uh, at all because he didn't know about that. Uh, but those lines of evidence have supported Darwin's observation in The Origin of Species. So we do have direct observations of evolutionary change. Uh, we know that uh, drug-resistant bacteria have evolved. Uh, and by drug-resistant, I mean antibiotic-resistant. We know that uh, microbiologists have been able to collect uh, cultures of different pathogenic bacteria and preserve them. And w throughout uh, the history of microbiology, we can compare strains of bacteria that have been cultured from uh, human diseases and uh, we can track when we see pathogen res or antibiotic resistant strains. So this is a color enhanced uh, scanning electron micrograph of a bacterium called MRSA, MRSA, which stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, this is Staphylococcus aureus is one bacterium that causes what we call a staph infection. Uh, staph is S-T-A-P-H, short for Staphylococcus. Um, and this is commonly something that we find uh, if you have an infected cut, you, get a, you can get a staph infection. Uh, it can also affect other parts of the body. Uh, anyway, uh, this particular strain of Staphylococcus aureus is an acute concern to uh, medical personnel because uh, it is resistant to many types of antibiotics, not just methicillin, but methicillin uh, is one of our most potent antibiotics. And we're finding that uh, there's this strain of bacteria that can uh, resist it, which is not good because it could spread very widely. And if we don't have a method of uh, giving antibiotics for it, uh, it could lead to a lot of suffering in the world. Uh, so we know that Staphylococcus aureus became resistant to, to penicillin in 1945. So uh, shortly after penicillin was introduced, there was a huge surge in the number of cultures of penicillin-resistant penicillin Staphylococcus aureus. You compare to strains of Staphylococcus aureus before the widespread introduction of penicillin, and very few of those strains have that resistance gene. Uh, methicillin, uh, introduced in 1959, two years later, we're finding strains of Staphylococcus aureus that are resistant to that antibiotic. So what's going on is that uh, methicillin inhibits a protein used in cell wall production. Remember, uh, antibiotics, the way that they work is we take something that poisons uh, enzymes uh, in, in a microorganism, like a bacterium, like the production of a cell wall. We don't produce cell walls, so they don't harm our bodies. Uh, so MRSA bacteria have a different protein that they can use in their cell walls. So they can get around that protein being inhibited. So when we expose uh, MRSA strains to methicillin, they are more likely to survive and reproduce, reproduce than the non-resistant Staphylococcus strains. So now MRSA strains are resistant to many different antibiotics, and this is bad news. Uh, so here is a map of the chromosome of a particular clone, a uh, genetically identical individual of Staphylococcus aureus. We can see that it's got... Uh, a gene for methicillin resistance, a gene that increases the pathogenicity or disease severity, uh, and also a gene that enables it to uh, pass the genes for methicillin resistance on to other uh, bacteria. Uh, 